Hi, welcome to Crops TV. My name is Angie Reek Hintz. I'm an extension field agronomist in North Central Iowa. And today we're gonna to talk about the 2020 drought, sort of where that's left us in terms of soil water. And we're gonna talk about soil, wa soil water holding capacity. And what do we need for 2021? Plus some management options to start thinking about before planting season gets here. Our agenda for today is to go through that drought uh, monitor and look at what happened over the course of the year because it was highly variable in different parts of Iowa. We're going to reinvestigate soil principles, a little bit about water holding capacity, and a little bit about infiltration. We're going to talk about how much water do we need to grow that crop in 2021, and then again, management considerations for if we have a dry spring. What you're seeing now is a loop of the U.S. Drought Monitor for the state of Iowa from the first week of April through December. And as this plays in this loop, what you see is how that drought started. We didn't really show, Iowa didn't really show up on that drought monitor until the first part of May. And then it kind of changed back and forth throughout May. And then it continued to intensify right up and through harvest in some places while some areas improved in terms of where they were in the drought monitor categories, other places worsened over time. So you can actually access on the U.S. Drought Monitor webpage and play these graphics for yourself. So here's where we are as of Thursday, December 17th. This was the latest drought monitor report. You can see that big red blob up in Northwest Iowa, where we take a look at it's extremely considered extremely dry. And then we have varying degrees of yellow throughout a good chunk, almost a third of the state of Iowa. We don't really anticipate this to change a whole lot. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go. To go along with that drought monitor, I kind of want to give you some real time situation here. So I use the Iowa, Iowa Mesonet at, hosted at Iowa State University. And what I have are 12 locations throughout Iowa. I have the western third of Iowa represented by Sheldon, Iowa, Holstein, Iowa, and Atlantic, Iowa. The center third of Iowa represented by Mason City, Ames, and Sheraton and then the eastern third of Iowa represented by Decorah, Dubuque, and Washington. Some of this data came directly from our research farms and others came from just general locations so I could pick various locations around the state of Iowa. When we look at this map, we can see what the total precipitation is for each location. So that was the actual precipitation between April 15th and December 13th of 2020. We can see the next line in each of those locations says CLIMO, which is the average. So it's a long-term average of rainfall for that particular site during those dates. And then we can see the departure. So we can see that the western third of Iowa, all the numbers are negative. For example, Sheldon is a minus 10.17 inches of rainfall for this year. And yet when we look at Dubuque, we can see Dubuque is a positive one point four or five inches of rain for this year. So that's how this slide is read. And I wanna like just briefly talk about the fact that obviously the Western Iowa numbers match up really well with that drought. Even Mason City uh, is behind on rainfall for this, for this year in terms of that April 15th through December 13th time period. Ames is 10 inches behind average on rainfall. Sheraton is behind average, and yet Southeast Iowa is even above average as is Dubuque. So this tracks really well and really is what helps relate to our drought monitor. Now, if we were gonna look at average precipitation from November 1st to April 15th, so I went in and I took those same sites, and what I did in the Iowa Mesonet is I looked at the average or normal rainfall we could expect from November 1st to April 15th. So I can't predict obviously what's gonna happen from November 1st of 2020 to April 15th of 2021, but this is the long-term average data out of the Iowa Mesonet. And you can see those numbers there average anywhere from seven plus, just over seven inches to all the way up to 11 inches in some cases or 10 inches. So that's what we would expect for our winter precip up and through April 15th. Will we get that? 
I can't make that prediction, and I'm going to leave that conversation for Dr. Justin Glisson when he does his Crops TV talk. But we hope that we get some soil subsoil moisture recharge out of events we normally see through the winter and the spring. The next few slides, I'm going to focus on some data from my colleagues Joel DeYoung and Paul Castle, who are both located in Northwest Iowa. Joel and Paul actually took some, so, some soil moisture tests this year. Um, these are at the Iowa State long-term soil moisture sites. This started in 1955. Those sites are sampled in November and April, and they're pre-selected sites. So I wanna thank Paul for sharing his photo and Paul and Joel for doing that back-breaking work of taking those five-foot samples. So when we look at this particular data, you can see all the locations, right? The black line down the middle just means I divided that table so it was a little bit easier to read. We can look at where the county is, what county these samples were taken in. We can look at the crop that was grown in 2020. And then we can look at the inches of water available in a five foot soil profile. So you can see those numbers range from six inches down to 1.8 inches. So 1.8 inches of soil moisture uh, taken on November 3rd is not very much soil moisture when we normally think about soil water holding capacity. So I wanna give you just a moment to kind of look through that. As far as I know, these were the only samples taken this fall and there weren't any taken from other sites in Iowa. But if I can find that data, um, I'll be happy to share it um, through our resource link a little bit later. Just to give you an example of where that moisture is, this is data provided by Paul Castle. So once again, a big shout out to my colleagues for sharing their data. You can look at locations, Spirit Lake, Esterville, Rossi, which is in Clay County, Newell, Rolf, and Schaller. And then what Paul did was when he dried these samples, right, we take samples in one foot increments down to five foot depth for this particular soil moisture test. We dry the samples when they come out of the soil, um, and then we look at weight change from soil to soil as in situ or as it comes out of the ground to after we dry it to see what the change in moisture content is. So we know what the inches of available water are in this case, or at least inches of water in the soil profile. So these were taken November 3rd, or at least the data was reported as of November 3rd. You can see for the majority of those locations that over 50% of the moisture at each of those locations is found in that upper soil profile, right? The upper one foot. When we get below that one foot depth, there is just not a lot of soil moisture available at those locations in Western Iowa. To give you a larger perspective of what we're seeing, this is the zero to 100 centimeter relative soil moisture map, right? Available soil water in percentage. So zero to 40 centimeters, zero to 100 centimeters is actually 40 inches in soil depth. And you can see even on this map, those dry areas show up in Northwest Iowa, but they explain, they expand greatly once we get into the plain states, uh, parts of Texas, and you can see the whole Southwestern corner of the United States is fairly dry at this point in time. This data was as of December 13th of 2020. I'm gonna shift gears for a little bit. I know some of you are gonna find this next slide somewhat humorous. And if you're an alum of Iowa State University and the agronomy department, and you took Agronomy 154, you will recognize Dr. Schaefer sitting on the log, right? That's how he started all of his classes and said some of the best learning was between the teacher and the student in an environment that the student could ask questions. So I thought it would be a little humorous to add some levity to some of all of this and uh, just remind us that Dr. Schaefer did teach us a lot about soil principles, and this may be a flashback for some of you who took Agronomy 154. I know it is for me. I took that class, and I also TA'd that class for three years. So a reminder, soil water holding capacity, right? We all have this graph somewhat ingrained in our head. On the axis, we have soil mo moisture content in percent, right? And on the bottom, we have different soil textures, starting with sand at the left 
and going across and increasing in loam content or clay content or silt content as we go to the right. So sand on the left, clay on the right. This is a soil water holding capacity chart. So the black line at the very top is field capacity. That's what soils hold when soils are full, right? That's the upper end of our available water holding. And it's the upper end of our available water for plant supply. Anything above that line becomes gravitational water and is drained through the system, right? The soil cannot hold that. Between field capacity and the black line where wilting point is, is what's called available water. That's what we use for plant uptake and growth. The orange part of the graph, anything below the black line in the wilting point or unavailable water is still water held in the soil, but not available for plant uptake. So as we review this graph just a little bit, what you really see is that sands have a lot of available water. When sands have water, they have a lot of available water. There's not a lot of tension in that sand, so water can easily be taken up by those plants. Obviously, sands don't hold water for very long. And as we move to the right on the graph and we get into the clays, clays hold a really large amount of water compared to all other soil textures, correct? But we see that wilting point is much higher and the available water is actually less in a clay soil than it is in something like a sandy loam or a loam, particularly the loams. Simply because we have so much tension on that water in the soil is that plants cannot extract that water or pull that water from the soil. So this bears some review, right? And it's just a quick slide. Uh, like I said, some of you may be having some flashbacks. So soil water holding capacity is the amount of water that a given soil can hold for crop use. And soil water holding capacity is impacted by several things. So soil texture, or that ratio of sand, silt, and clay, organic matter present in the soil, and then depth of profile has some impact, right? Because if you have a shallower profile due to a root limiting layer or bedrock or whatever the situation may be, we can't pull water out of those layers if we can't get roots into those layers. So if we have a restrictive layer, obviously the depth of profile is gonna be much smaller and the depth of water that we can pull from is actually gonna be much smaller. So let's take a look at soil moisture content in inches of water per foot of soil. So what I have there are some different soil textures on the left-hand side. I have how much water that soil texture holds at field capacity. I have how much water is there at at the wilting point, and normally we'd call that 15 bars, right, or minus 15 bars, uh, probably old terminology in this case. And then we can take field capacity minus wilting point, and what we come up with is available water. So this is just another graphical way of showing you uh, how much water sand, sand versus clay can hold. Um, and once again, this is available water. So I kind of want to put this into some context, hopefully, that you can look at from a geographical perspective, realizing we are very blessed in Iowa to have some very good soils, but we also have a wide range of soils across the state of Iowa. So what we talk about today particularly may not apply in your field or on your farm because soil textures change within feet. Soil textures change geographically as we move from those lust soils to the till soils into eastern Iowa. So we just want to give you an example of what that might look like. So uh, I picked a Galva soil, right? A 310B on a B slope, which is 2 to 5%. This is actually from the research farm up at Sutherland. What you can see there are the soil horizon designations. I told you we were going to revisit the log, right? So we have an AP or that plow layer down to our C layer. I showed you the depth of each of those because that's what came out of my soil survey. And then I so showed you the soil textural class for each of those layers or horizons in the soil. At the bottom of each of those uh, graphics is the total amount of water held in that soil. So for example, you can see at a, in a Galva soil, right, where the uh, surface texture of a silty clay loam is we have about 10 inches of available water. 
When we look at a clarion loam here in central Iowa on the research farm at Iowa State University, right, you can see most of that texture is loam texture, and you can see we're over 11 inches of available water. So, and then as we move to the southeast research farm at Crawfordsville, we're looking at a tainter soil, the 279. Um, this would be a zero to 2% slope in this particular case. You can see we're nine, just a little over nine inches of soil um, water holding capacity, so less than the other two. A lot of this has to do with that particular layer of that silty clay that you can see in that uh, BG horizon. And we know as that clay content increases, while it can hold more water, less water is actually available for plant uptake. So what's it gonna take for 2021? Uh, I'm, 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 not, uh, um, I'm not looking into the crystal ball. I'm gonna save that discussion for our climatologist. But we normally think of a crop using somewhere between 20 and 25 inches of water. This obviously depends on the growing season. It depends on humidity. It depends on uh, soils. It depends on uh, lots of things growing out there, even particular hybrids, right? Things are a little bit different. So when we think if we have a five foot soil profile and we're only averaging 2.8 inches of water now from those slides I showed you from the data of Paul and Joel, we're gonna need somewhere between 17 and 22 inches of rain just for that crop, let alone that doesn't really tell us what we need to fill a soil, pro soil profile, right? So it's going to take some moisture. Um, we hope we see that this spring, uh, and we'll let, we'll let Justin talk about what the future might look like there. So let's revisit what some of this looks like from a large scale or over the course of this last year. Once again, this data comes from the Iowa Mesonet the Soil Moisture and Precipitation Time Series. This particular graph is from Sutherland from the research farm in Northwest Iowa. So what you can see uh, on the axis is the volumetric water content. So this scale goes from 10 to 40%. And then across the bottom, we see the time series. So this actually started April 1st, right? We see a date of May 15th, we see a date of June, and we go all the way up through December 5th when I pulled this data. Let me walk you through what each of those graphs are. So the blue lines going up and down or straight up and down are hourly precipitation. So it shows you sort of what days we received precipitation. The red line going across the graph that goes up and down, all kind of all over the place, is the 12 inch um, volumetric water content. The I guess I'd call it purple, but maybe it's not purple for you. The purple line is the 24 inch depth. And then finally the black line is the 50 inch depth in the soil. So what do we see from this graph? We see when we started out back in April that our soil capacity or our soil profile was nearly full or full, right? The red and purple lines, so the 12 inch and 24 inch line are basically right on top of each other. Um, and our subsoil at 50 inches uh, is somewhere around 40% capacity, right? Where's the rest of that capacity go, you ask? Well, you know, this is the pore space filled with water and the rest of it is the mineral fraction and organic fraction of the soil. So as we go through this year and we move to the right on that graph, we can see the high variability in the red and purple graphs as we move through June and into early July. And then once we hit late June or so, what we see is our moisture frequency has dropped off a little bit um, and our top soil moisture, that top 12 inches and our uh, layer up to 24 inches, those lines start to go downward rapidly, right? Much less water in that soil profile. The 50 inch line stays pretty constant until we get till about the end of June and then it slowly drops off after time as well, right? We don't tend to pull as much water um, from, that, from those deeper layers in the soil. Although our roots can not extend that far, we just don't pull that much water from those. So you can see every time we had a precip event or nearly every time we had a precip event, that red line or that top 12 inches of soil, the water content goes up but each time it did that, it rapidly, fairly rapidly came back down again. 
We get into August all the way through the 1st of November, and those lines remain fairly constant. There wasn't a lot of precip in that time period. Um, even when we get into late October or November, when we don't have crops that are pulling water out of there, those lines continue to stay pretty consistent. We see a little positive blip in that 12 inch line when we get just shortly after the 1st of November for some, from some precipitation events. And what we see at the end when we timed this out about December 5th is that our soil moisture content is much below where we started this spring. So we started the spring with a full profile. That's probably what got our crop as far as it did when you look at this time series. So what will that mean going forward in time? Well, we need to fill that profile up again, as I stated earlier, for at least for our crop production. I wanna show you one more series of these graphs. This is from Crawfordsville, so the complete opposite side of the state. You can see at Crawfordsville, um, a, a few more precipitation events, right? They, this scale is a little bit different. Please recognize that. Um, once again, soil capacity is nearly full to begin the year with, or at least to begin the growing season, the 1st of April with. Um, and it stays, that 12 inch line and that 24 inch line stay relatively in lockstep until we get all the way until about July when things start to dry out. Their 50 inch depth water stays fairly constant throughout the entire year. Um, and then we dried out a little bit, right, in July, all the way through August, mid-August or so. Those red lines and purple lines went down, and then you can see they quickly bounced back up with some precipitation events. So if you listen to Dr. Archintoulis talk earlier in Crops TV, he, he'll tell you it doesn't take much to get that top few inches of water back again, right? But it tends to disappear really quick, and in particular when we still have crops growing. So at Crawfordsville, they are ending the year about where they started the year in terms of soil moisture. So when we talk about drought, right, it was highly variable across the state this year. Some areas saw major crop impacts, right, uh, impacted yields, uh, poor stock quality, all kinds of things going on out there. Other parts of the state were not impacted at all and saw some really good yields come out of this. Once again, that drought conditions changed constantly from April up until about November. So areas that were dry early on seemed to moderate a little bit, but not till after the growing season. Areas that are super dry now, like in Northwest Iowa, weren't so dry at the beginning of the season or even into June or July. That all happened since that time period. So it's very variable across the state. We do not anticipate drought conditions will drastically worsen over the winter months for a couple of reasons, right? Usually drier months are winter months from November through about March are usually tend to be drier in terms of precipitation. We don't get that much precip or moisture out of even our snowfall events. The ground is frozen, so we don't have infiltration of water. Now, the ground is not frozen in many places right now, today, December 18th, but normally our ground freezes up over the winter. And then, of course, we don't have any crop demand, right? We're not pulling water from that soil. So we don't anticipate things will change drastically. They will probably change, but not uh, dramatically worsen. Other things I wanna think about in terms of impacts on crops, um, not just from a drought, and I may get some pushback from bullet number one. Soils were less than ideal for planting in the spring of 2020. Now, right now, you're all looking at me saying, Angie, this was the best spring we've had in years. Yes, we had a fairly dry spring. Yes, we planted earlier than we've planted in many years. We didn't get a lot of big spring rainfalls. We weren't kept out of the field for long periods of time. It was a pretty good spring for a lot of people across Iowa. However, those top inch or two of soils were fairly dry and allowed us to get in and plant earlier and plant in better conditions. But below that top inch or two, those soils were still wet in many cases where we planted. So we experienced some sidewall compaction that limited root growth or root expansion. We have to think about 
what the fall of 2019 was, right? It was a horrible fall. It was wet. It took forever to get things harvested. We caused a lot of compaction out of there, out of 2019, the fall of 2019. That just didn't go away by the time we planted, right? It doesn't come and go that quickly. It takes a while for that to all kind of even out. So we have compaction out there too that limits root growth when we plant and as our crops grow throughout the season. I'm not gonna spend any time talk about edge effect. We're still trying to figure that out. Is it a humidity issue? Is it a hybrid issue? Why are we seeing that edge effect? But we definitely saw that a lot this year and that contributed to some yield loss. Whatever's causing it, and there's a lot of theories on that, uh, it definitely contributed to yield loss. Hybrid selection, right? What you planted in 2019, that might have been your best hybrid or your ver best variety in that particular case, maybe wasn't your best this year, right? They were two complete opposite years in terms of rainfall, uh, stress, all those things that happened out there. So we would expect some hybrid response out of that in terms of uh, acclimating to our climate situation this year. And then we're going to talk about timing of drought stress on crop development. I'm not going to spend any time on that. You can see from that drought monitor video we showed you how variable those drought conditions were. They didn't all happen at the same time. In some cases, it came and went, right, in terms of dry conditions. But I want you to know that on January 28th at 9 a.m., I would invite you to tune into Crops TV to listen to Dr. Jeff Coulter from the University of Minnesota. His discussion that day will look at drought tolerance and corn hybrids affected by timing of drought stress initiation, something we will probably all learn a lot from. Can we do a lot about it? Maybe not. Will we better understand the impacts on corn? Most definitely. I want to shift gears for the last time and talk a little bit about where we are in terms of management considerations going into spring. First of all, we're gonna talk about nitrogen. Nitrogen mineralization will be less in drier soils. We saw nitrogen mineralization reduced a little bit this spring because of cooler soil temperatures, but we need moisture for those soil microbes to work. So if we continue to be dry, I would expect the nitrogen we get from the soil will be a little bit less and probably will be slower to happen going into spring of 2021 based on our dry conditions. If yield is reduced, right, if we had reduced yield in 2020, our N uptake would have been reduced. So it's possible that nitrogen is still there for uptake in 2021. A lot of that's going to depend on rainfall we get yet this fall, right, or winter, um, and potential losses uh, going forward, like leaching losses over the spring if we do get some moisture. So there are ways to look at that. I would encourage you to go read some ICM articles on how to measure your spring end content going into planting season. The other thing we need to think about in terms of nitrogen is application. And in particular with anhydrous, right, if soils are dry, we still want those soils to be able to seal we still want to get that nitrogen placed or that anhydrous placed deep enough that we're not going to lose it uh, up through upwards out through the soil. So if soils are dry, we're going to need to be extra careful in making sure that we're getting that anhydrous placed where it needs to be so we don't lose it. Our next consideration, management consideration, is in terms of herbicides. First of all, pre-emergence herbicides, right, need rain to get them incorporated into the soil if we're not manually incorporating them. Normally, we say that's about a half inch of rain. So our pre-emergence timing this next spring, if we continue to stay dry, will be crucial, right? We can't just go out there and expect to apply a pre-emerge herbicide and it work to its full capacity if those soils are dry. We may need to consider light tillage for incorporation, right? And by that, I mean light tillage and not where we're throwing up dirt or trying to find moisture by doing deeper tillage. So something to think about there. When we talk about winter annuals, <laughs> it may be very beneficial if you have a winter annual problem to burn those down earlier in the season so that they're not sucking moisture out of the soil if we stay dry. So we wanna conserve that soil moisture 
Plus, if it's dry, those winter annuals are going to be a little drought stressed. I don't know if I want to use the term drought stress, but they'll be under more stress. Um, and they're definitely harder to kill when they're under drought stress. So something to think about that in terms of weed management. Cover crops. I wish I had a lot of data to share with you, but there's two theories, right? Number one, cover crops may need to be terminated earlier to conserve soil moisture. There are a lot of people that plant cover crops. They believe, and it's true, they do pull more moisture out of the ground, and it allows them to get in for planting a little bit earlier than maybe neighbors who are not using cover crops or using not using cover crops and are doing conventional tillage. So that's great. The cover crop provides us a means of drying that soil a little bit, but we also want to make sure we have plenty of moisture there when we go to plant our corn and soybeans. So we may need to think about earlier terminating, earlier termination on our cover crops. On the other hand, some of you are going to tell me, but if I let my cover crop grow and I dry out my soil, I will have more residue to trap moisture. That's also true. But to trap that moisture, you've got to have it in the soil in the first place. A couple of more management considerations in terms of planting through about V3, right? If soils remain drier going into spring, they will warm up quickly. So the likelihood of us having an earlier planting season looks pretty decent right now when I'm talking in December, right? Do we need to consider planting into moisture if our top couple of inches of soil are dry? That's one consideration we'll talk about later in Crops TV. And then when we think about emergence to V3, we need adequate soil moisture for ro nodal root development. Nodal roots are really important for anchoring our soil, our crop, at least our corn in the soil, correct? So if soils are dry, what we tend to see is those nodal roots are either very slow to develop or we desiccate those root tips. The root tips die, the roots can die, and then we experience floppy corn syndrome. So make sure when we plant this spring that we're planting at an adequate depth to make sure we get good nodal root development Maybe, depending on what happens, I don't want to uh, forecast bad things, but we may need to think about waiting to plant until we have some moisture on the horizon, so to speak, or we plant early enough, we know we can still catch some rains. So all things to think about, right, going into the spring. With that, I want to say thanks for listening today and joining us for Crops TV. And because I'm the last presentation before the holidays, I want to wish you all happy holidays, and I wish everyone a very happy new year. Thank you.